Hej allesammans, mycket varmt välkomna till Vetenskapens hus och till dagens populärvetenskapliga lunchföreläsning. Föreläsningen kommer att hållas på engelska, men eftersom jag identifierar er allihop som svenskspråkiga så inleder jag på svenska. Och jag kommer också att avsluta på svenska. På torsdagarna den här terminen så ger vi i Vetenskapens hus en serie föreläsningar om hållbara transporter. Huset används ju av oss inom universitetet i samarbete med Ingenjörsvetenskapsakademin och LKAB. Så att vi tar alla tre plats i det här huset på lite olika sätt. Och universitetet som jag då representerar och även dagens föreläsare kommer ifrån vi gör det här för att vi vill berätta om de, föreläs om de forskningsämnen och de, de, den verksamhet som vi bedriver. Men också att ni presenterar ett nätverk av forskare för er. Våra kontakter. Som också kan bidra till att göra Luleå till en attraktiv och hållbar stad. Den här hösten, våren, <går> våren är det som sagt var hållbara transporter. Tidigare terminer har det varit andra starka forsknings- och innovationsområden vi har presenterat. And today we are going to talk about snow. And the person who, who is going to talk about snow is Lavan Epanapelli, who is a PhD student in experimental mechanics. And you are going to talk about the quality of snow. And if I would like to set the stage, for a lecture on snow, it would be exactly this very snowy kind of fairy tale winter that we have this year, which we have been lacking a couple of years and missing a lot. The quality of snow is the today's subject. And after the lecture, we will open for questions if there are any. And um, we will approximately end at late, no later than one o'clock. So, Lavan, it's your stage. What do you have to say to us about the quality of snow? Thank you, Soy, for the introduction. <coughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lavan. I'm a PhD student from Experimental Mechanics. And uh, first of all, thank you uh, for having uh, interest in my research and to be here. And today I'm going to talk about the quality of snow and how we are actually looking into this subject using some uh, optical measurements. Uh, before we get into the technical technicalities, I'm going to uh, introduce myself. I was born and uh, raised up in uh, Hyderabad. It's a southern part of India. That's where uh, I did my or I studied up to my bachelor's in mechanical engineering. Then I moved to Kotiho in Stockholm for the for my master's. I was uh, I've been to Jotobari and then uh, Germany for some internships during my master's time. And then uh, after that, I've uh, begun my PhD in uh, Lulio in 2014. And uh, in a couple of months, I'm going to defend my PhD. So it's a uh, uh, quite busy schedule going on now. <laughs> And uh, today, uh, I'm going to briefly uh, give a background of the subject that I've been working on, and then uh, applications that are relevant to my research, and uh, techniques that are actually available already in the, in the society. Uh, and then uh, I'm, I divided our method into two parts, uh, approach one and approach two. And then I will end with uh, some conclusions. Uh, uh, snow, uh, snowflake, it's actually a single uh, ice crystal or it's uh, clusters of ice crystals. And once the snow falls down, several ice crystals combine together and bond together and then they form a layer of snow that we usually see outside. So that's a layer of snow. It's a and I have a, a small uh, uh, video. When you have a snow, it depends on can't see it. Uh, 
uh, it's depend on the temperature in that in that in the atmosphere and it depend based on the temperature if the red means it's uh, above 0 degrees centigrade and when you have a warm temperature in the atmosphere the snow becomes water or uh, sleet or uh, freezing rain and rain so it depends on how the temperature is in the atmosphere and the snow has a different shape or a, a flake has different shape based on the temperature and then humidity but this is uh, uh, something i'm not going to talk about it's just uh, different shapes uh, because my research is uh, uh, slightly different from uh, the green shapes uh, and when you have these snow layers because uh, due to the weather conditions or uh, age uh, the snow layers change and then a property that uh, one should consider is actually how the snow compacts itself and then when the snow compacts then there are uh, several factors that are associated with this uh, snow compaction uh, uh, these are the four uh, that i have noted down here and the snow density it's uh, uh, how much snow you can uh, fill in in a volume of the same mass so on the top layer you have a fresh snow it's usually uh, very low density because you can, uh, for the for the mass you have to put you need more volume and if you have a ice for the same mass you need uh, less volume so it's ice has more uh, high density than uh, snow and then uh, old snow which is slightly older during its age that also has a slightly higher density than a fresh snow so density is one of the properties that uh, uh, i'm interested in and also how the grains distribute in a snow uh, as you see here uh, 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 on on the top left when you have this four graphs on the top left you have uh, these grains that are combined to each other and as the time uh, moves on and then uh, weather conditions changes those grains start to combine each other and then you start to see more and more uh, single uh, snow ice crystals and then uh, liquid water content for example now uh, you have more uh, liquid water in the snow because it's uh, not really cold so the snow actually has uh, some liquid because when it falls down you see some liquid not actually snow but when it snows like in minus 12 you actually see snowflakes not uh, like water so that is also uh, im i'm interested in how much how i can actually interpret this liquid water in the snow Uh, and then uh, the surface texture for example when you have uh, now you have a snow and then uh, after a while you will have a, a melted snow and then if it is negatives the melted snow becomes more uh, uh, icy structures that is a bit difficult to drive or uh, walk so i'm also interested in uh, how this kind of surface actually uh, uh, interpret or influence the uh, snow properties or snow quality So these are the four uh, properties I am actually interested in in my PhD, and then uh, to understand or to investigate these properties, I am uh, using uh, albedo or surface reflectivity, uh, where you shine a light on snow or a surface, and then light uh, reflects into several directions, and then you can uh, look into uh, how the this reflected uh, radiance. based on the reflected radiance you can actually uh, make a correlation between the snow quality and then these uh, four properties so this is uh, what i have been doing on uh, but uh, uh, in in general for example uh, when you see a white cloud it's actually uh, it's uh, the depth of the cloud and also the the, uh, the particles in the cloud they are smaller compared to a wavelength of light that's when it distributes all the light so it looks uh, white when you have a cloud that has a uh, it's completely black so it has water molecules that are actually bigger in size so they absorb the light and then even it's also a denser cloud so uh, the light doesn't pass through the cloud so in general life we see this kind of uh, physical uh, properties physical phenomena where we can actually understand uh, Uh, if the if there is more water in a cloud if there is no water in a cloud based on how they absorb the light so this was one of the uh, uh, major uh, criteria for my research how snow and different types of snow absorbs light in a different way 
and then uh, but for this uh, we cannot uh, for this we are not actually using uh, visible light the light that we usually see uh, it starts from uh, 300 or 300 to 700 nanometers so it uh, ranges from uh, blue to red and after the red we have uh, infrared that is uh, uh, you see here from 700 to 1 uh, millimeter and then I'm um, uh, mostly so this is infrared radiation it's a uh, it's we don't see humans cannot uh, our eyes are not sensitive to this light but we only see the visible light because our eyes are sensitive to this visible light uh, and then the reason why I selected uh, visible or infrared radiation because if you see here on the top you have a snow and then uh, you have rock and vegetation and water uh, as you see snow uh, uh, at least in the in the first part you have a visible wavelength a spectrum where snow is uh, on the top which means that it reflects all the light that is why it looks uh, white for us uh, for example uh, water here it is uh, it has uh, here on the y axis it's uh, the low means it's uh, highly absorbent so it absorbs all the light and 100 is reflects all the light so if you just compare snow on the top and water on the bottom so snow is the one that reflects all the light so it looks white and water is the one that absorbs most of it so it depends on how de deep the water so it has a slight uh, uh, reflection but mostly absorption but uh, as you see in the visible spectrum uh, snow has equal reflectivity so it's a bit difficult to actually uh, classify uh, different snow types within this region so what i've uh, so in this case we have used from 900 to 1700 so this is infrared radiation in this radiation as you see in this small box the snow starts to behave differently because you see these uh, peaks uh, uh, this is uh, how they actually check your uh, let's say sugar level in your blood so they take your blood and then uh, look for this spectrum where you have uh, some peaks if you have a peak that has a high amplitude or high intensity then uh, they say that you have high sugar in your blood it's the same uh, technique so but this case we are actually using this for the snow so snow has different uh, uh, reflectivity or absorption levels within this infrared so that's why uh, we have we, we have been using this infrared radiation not the visible one that we usually say uh, and then coming to applications where actually this research uh, applicable uh, this is where I actually started my PhD looking for uh, icing on a wind turbine how the wind turbine uh, freezes because up here in cold climate you you have a lot of wind turbines and the problem is they get icing and then uh, they don't uh, work as they should be and then sometimes you they uh, destroy themselves so uh, uh, somewhere in PTO they uh, also used a helicopter to uh, flush the ice away so it's quite expensive uh, technique to melt this ice so nowadays they have some techniques to detect it but it's not very optimal so there is a chance for uh, for these kind of uh, techniques to apply there and then for the road as well uh, so it's always uh, good to know what kind of surface you're actually driving on you have some techniques now on your in your cars but then uh, still they take some of the sensors into consideration but not actually the the snow quality or the surface quality so there, that is also uh, very important i was working with pirelli the one in the uh, where they were we were testing uh, the tracks to see if uh, how the snow quality changes as they drive as they break so how we can actually interpret these uh, properties and then uh, for the ski tracks so when you actually glide yourself on the ski slopes you have to understand how the snow quality on the slope so that you can actually get better uh, gliding so there is also uh, some applications and on the top you have avalanches so that is also you, you, if you can understand how the snow quality is avalanches you can uh, make better predictions of the avalanches and then on the right side here you have uh, some snow and ice hydrology this is where they have been doing some research how uh, the ice in the northern part of the world melting away because the fresh snow on the top is melting then slowly water starts to drip 
inside the ice and pores, let's say. So that starts to break the ice, uh, the very, very old ice. So there is also they are trying to understand how we can actually uh, get a better quality measurements. And then uh, just for just like driving, we also have to know how we can uh, walk on a surface, how we can actually get a better understanding of a surface. And then uh, for airplanes, uh, they apply some anti-icing when we fly from Stockholm to Lulio or Lulio to Stockholm. But uh, it's better to understand what kind of uh, quality surface you have on the airplane uh, blade so that you can apply a better uh, this coating methods. So there are several applications that are actually quite relevant uh, for these kind of research. But of course, there are already some techniques available within, the, within these uh, applications. For example, for the wind power, they have uh, uh, proposed several techniques. Like on the left side, it's a lot of techniques have been proposed in uh, manuscripts and uh, articles. But some of, uh, some of them made to the commercial way. And uh, if you see on the right side, you have, uh, uh, I have listed three uh, very famous uh, sensors. It's like we have a, a blade. It's a small probe that has a that uh, connected to the blade surface. So it just sends a light and then takes a, a, a reflection back. Based on what kind of surface you have on the blade, it can uh, give you if you have ice on the blade or no ice. But the problem with this technique is it can only say like one or zero or ice or no ice. But uh, it's important to actually understand what kind of ice you have. Is it a frost? Is it only snow, like just mel uh, stuck to the blade? Or is it actually really ice? <laughs> so if you know this kind of uh, information, you can actually use the, because for the wind power, they have de-icing methods. They use, uh, they blow hot air into the wind, uh, the blades, so that they can melt the blades. So they have techniques to remove this, but they don't have uh, a really optimal technique to actually find this uh, issue. And then for the winter roads, uh, we have uh, several things. For example, we have in the car ESP, the electronic uh, stability program that can uh, just slide your car in a way that you don't slide yourself. And then uh, uh, on the top left here, uh, they have uh, some uh, infrared uh, imaging technique that can actually take an image of what you actually see in front so that it can actually uh, uh, make a understanding or investigation of what kind of surface you're going to drive to. And on the on the uh, left hand bottom here, you have uh, some sensors that can uh, it's like ESP that can uh, see if you're actually sliding to one side, so it can apply brakes on the uh, other side of the brake so that you don't slide. So there are techniques, but they don't actually find the surface or uh, detect the surface. It's more they won't detect the motion of the car. And on the right side top, this is a uh, we have the similar technique that uh, Yvonne Kasagrian has been working on. Uh, it can uh, find what kind of surface you have, different types of surfaces on the roads. And on the bottom here, right side bottom, you have a, a transducer. So this one can actually detect the change in sound. So when, you, when your tire actually slide on the ice or snow or slush, for example, based on different types of acoustics, it can detect that, okay, you're actually driving on the ice. So this is like a transducer. It, it, it works on the sound, not on the light. So there are some techniques already uh, within this, uh, at least in the road uh, treatment for the winters. And for example, for the ski slope, this was a very, very old uh, technique that they use the same, uh, they use an infrared camera. So they take an image of the heating uh, uh, signature, for example. So they take the whole uh, signature of the ski slope where, I mean, you can just, uh, you have, it's very portable. You just you slide on the slope and then you can have this uh, camera with you and then hold the detection system that can detect where you're actually where the temperature is very high between the skis and then slope or snow where there is not high because if you have type high temperature you're actually melting the the surface so it's you're not actually getting uh, really good uh, gliding uh, and then they have uh, some other technique uh, where they're actually looking into uh, finding uh, if we can find some liquid water in the ski slopes uh, on the right hand side. So uh, there are some techniques, but it's still there is a need for a, a optimal or a better way to actually uh, detect this uh, quality of snow. And then coming to our methods, uh, I have divided them into two parts. 
uh, spectral imaging, and then infrared photography, and then. Uh, but th our method, uh, what we have as an objective is like we want to develop a system that can actually be used to uh, characterize a snow, but based on these four properties: density and how the grain size varies, and how much liquid water does it have, and then surface texture, how the surface actually looks like. So I've been uh, uh, working on uh, developing a system and then uh, analysis, how we can actually make a correlation and of these properties. Uh, and then uh, for the first uh, approach, uh, when I say spectral imaging, I mean, as I said now, uh, when they check your sugar levels in the blood, so they take the sample and then they shine light through it, and then they, it, it gives you a color code like black, red, and different color codes. So black means the sample absorbs all the light, and then white means it uh, reflects all the light. So as you see on the top, uh, uh, the colors, color scale here, you have a different color scale. And then, that, uh, and then uh, just under the color scale, you have a, a spectrum that has like this. Uh, that spectrum gives you uh, the sample at which wavelengths it has been absorbing and which wavelength it has been uh, reflecting. And based on that information, you can actually try to understand what the sample actually has, if it has, uh, what kind of composition this uh, sample has. Uh, okay, so that is a uh, spectros spectroscopy that has been using uh, for a very very while in different applications. Uh, and then uh, in a lab, what I did, uh, what I did was I filled a uh, small box with a lot of snow. And then I was uh, shining light on the top of the surface. Then I take reflection back into a spectrometer, which gives me these uh, spectrums. Based on the spectrum, I can see if this surface or this uh, snow has what kind of composition this snow has. F for example, uh, uh, I've just put uh, different types of uh, snow here. On the top left, you have a spring snow. So this is like a very, very uh, rounded grains. You don't see them, but uh, you see them for a while when it's like, when you have snow, it melted, and then we have a freezing temperature, so the snow becomes like uh, ice uh, balls, really difficult to walk and difficult to drive around. So those kind of uh, snow or ice is uh, like a spring snow, so it has more uh, rounded balls. And then you have a, uh, on the right and the top side, you have a, a small grains. It is like a sugar grains. So the snow can also be like this, like a sugar. And then you have a fresh snow, uh, but uh, now it's not fresh snow. It's fresh snow, but it, is, it has a lot of water in it. So it's, but this one, it is uh, very, very dry. There is no liquid water present in this uh, snow. And, th and then the bottom right, you have a snow that is compacted. So I have compacted this really uh, well, so that it's like an uh, ice uh, brick. So just put some uh, different types of uh, snow. But the, there, there are several types of it. I mean, uh, just uh, the one outside is a different type of snow. And then if you just uh, start shoveling around, you see different layers of snow just on a, on a, on a level. Uh, always on the bottom, it's probably ice. And then you have some old snow that has been there for like a couple of months. Then you have different types of snows. And then each, each type of snow has a different uh, absorption qualities. And it reflects light in a different way. And then this is the spectrum that I was uh, talking about. So when you shine a light on these uh, surfaces, you get these uh, uh, spectrums. On the, on the x-axis, you have a, a wavelength, that is a light. Uh, on the y-axis, you have a reflectance. So 100 is like it reflects all the light. Zero is it absorbs all the light. And then uh, uh, here, uh, I have used 10 different snow types, from fresh to very, very old and from uh, grains and then uh, to different types of grain and then different types of density. So what uh, it's a bit difficult to understand from here, but what I want to say is uh, even though you have these different types of qualities in snow, they all have different absorption spectrums. I mean, none of them coincide each other. They're all separated. So it's easier for you to understand uh, how they're actually separated from each other. Just for example, uh, these two are uh, the snow that I just showed before. It's like a grains. It's not like a 
snow it's more like a sugar grains or uh, the grains you say when it is negatives and then there are uh, some uh, snow samples with uh, density changes but what i've realized was okay it's uh, difficult to take all this data and then try to analyze how this data works so i have only selected three parts of the whole data like one data from 980 and one data from uh, 1310 and one data from 1550 only just take three points of all the samples and analyze them if we can actually see any correlation from them uh, it, this is just uh, this is the same uh, from this like in the in the back but i just put them in different uh, separate plots so that you can actually see on the top left you have a uh, snow fresh snow and then uh, that has f1 90 and f1 340 that's uh, a value is a density value so when you have a fresh snow and slightly older fresh snow you have different densities so as the density increases you have a low absorption and then on the right hand side on the top you have uh, the snow with the uh, grains that also has different absorption and when you have this gra grand structure in the snows as the grains increase in size they starts to absorb more just like what i showed you before when you have a cloud with a lot of larger water molecules then the cloud starts to absorb more water then it looks black before the it rains but when it doesn't have that many water molecules in the cloud it looks white because it doesn't have that many to absorb the light the same technique uh, as the grain size increases it uh, increases uh, the absorption and on the left side in the bottom here i have a aged snow this is like a one month old snow that has slightly different uh, uh, reflectance spectrum and then i increase the density by compacting them that's why you see uh, 165 20 790 so there is a increase of uh, densities and as the density increases you get more and more reduction in uh, reflectance that's because when you start to compact it what you are actually doing is the surface is becoming more and more uh, smoother and then when it is when it is smooth surface the light only uh, goes into one specific angle because this was from a different angle so that's why you see a reduction but if you see uh, uh, i will show you later on but if you see from uh, different angles it might be uh, more uh, reflectance and then also on the right hand side in the bottom you have a old snow that is slightly older than uh, age that's why you see uh, for the aged snow you have this uh, uh, line where it is uh, let's say starts from 80% of the reflectance and if you go to the plot d the old snow it starts from starts from 70 so as the snow aged even more what happened is the snow grains they start to become more and more uh, spherical there are more and more grains so they start to absorb even more that's why there is a reduction in uh, in reflectance so this way you can actually uh, if you know what kind of actually snow you're looking into you can actually make a qualitative analysis based on density uh, and then grain structure so this is possible to do it this way and then here uh, what i've uh, did was Uh, this was uh, our intention was to uh, apply this for a ski slope where we can where to see if we can actually manage to detect uh, liquid water in snow so we have a snow and then we added a different uh, liquid water to it so you see 0 5 10 20 15 20 20 it's not only water it's uh, nacl plus water so that the water doesn't uh, freeze so it's even though there is snow it's still the water is in uh, liquid form so as you add more and more water uh, the absorbance starts to starts uh, yeah the absorbance starts to increase uh, yeah uh, but, but here you see uh, reflectance starts to decrease but it's the same thing reflectance increase and absorbance decrease uh because on the top when you have do, no liquid water it's a uh, fresh snow so it's a very very dry snow so it reflects as it should be as you start adding water into it water is the one that actually absorbs more of this light so that's why uh, that's that's the reason why you started to having more and more uh, uh, reduction in the reflectance because of the liquid water so we did some work here to say if we can actually uh, find uh, a way to 
correlate these properties so that we can actually go to any slope and then uh, take some measurement and possibly manage to say this uh, slope has a certain level of uh, liquid water. This was the idea of this uh, experiment. So that was more of spectroscopy. You take uh, different uh, wavelengths. But as I said, it's always not easy to take all this data. That's why we said only we took only three wavelengths, 980, 1310, 1550, because it's easier if you have only uh, sh small data but still get the same uh, output. And here, uh, what I did was, I have a, uh, because before it's more like a, a one broadband light, like you see here, that has different uh, wavelengths. But now we have selected three laser diodes, like this you have here, but this is green. It's uh, difficult to shine it on anyway. But uh, we have selected three laser diodes, something like this, but they have different wavelengths, like 980, 1310, 1550. So I use this. And then I use a infrared camera, so this camera can actually see these wavelengths, but we cannot see, and we cannot film it with any other uh, general cameras. And then I shine light from a certain angle, and light always reflects into different uh, directions when you shine on a surface. Then uh, detect or take a reflect or take a yeah, just uh, take the intensity or radiation into a detector from an angle. <laughs> this was a. Uh, uh, the actual setup that we have used. And then this was uh, uh, when I was working with Pirelli. Uh, I was in a frozen lake in Pitio. I was the only one, like a kilometer radius. So <laughs> it's a, uh, so we are looking into how snow quality changes. So I've used the same uh, setup, a camera and then three laser diodes and try to see if I can find any correlation. When you okay, you shine these lights. What what they actually look like? They they look like this. It's like a it's like a spot like this exactly. So you have three spots of each one of specific wavelength. But on the left side top, you have a dry surface, like very very dry. Uh, if you have a dry surface, it reflects all the light, so it's a very very bright spot. And then in the middle on top, you have a water. In water, it uh, absorbs the two other wavelengths, but only one is uh, slightly visible. That's why you see only one spot and the other two are completely absorbed, so you don't see them anymore. And on the right hand side top, you have a clear ice. So this is, you have water and then this has become ice again. So it's a uh, frozen water in a way. That also absorbs the two wavelengths, but slightly has a, slightly shows 980. And on the bottom here, left, you have a fresh snow uh, that reflects 980 and reflects slightly 1310 but absorbs 1550 so you can uh, and you have a, a snow that is aged like for a while like a one month so you have different uh, absorption there between fresh snow and aged snow when you have ice and water so we have ice and then when you start to melt so there is some water uh, also and there will be some difference in the absorption so based on this information you can actually make a correlation of what kind of surface you're looking into. I, is it a fresh snow? Is it aged snow? Is it ice? Is it water? Or is it just a dry surface? Uh, so this is a technique that uh, we have employed. <coughs> Sorry. As I said, uh, I was working on the snow quality for the tile testing. And what we did was uh, they prepared the track and then, uh, then I take a measurement with these three wavelengths. So it looks, uh, it looks like uh, the one in the bottom, the fresh snow. And then uh, they drive one time. Then I take a measurement again. Then they drive again. I take a measurement again. And then they, put they push brakes. Then where I push brakes, I take a measurement again. So that's why uh, you, you have a notation there, a fresh tra traction one, traction two, braking, braking two. So that's... Uh, traction is more driving and then braking is where the brake and what's happening is and uh, the one on the left side it is a plus two degrees and in the middle you have a minus two minus twelve sorry and the right side you have minus five so when it is plus two as you, as you know the snow is more uh, sensitive to any external pressure like you have outside now so if you just uh, press on it it just compress really quickly that's why you see really, really big difference from a fresh snow 
and then uh, when you break or when you did uh, tractions and then when it is minus 12 the snow is already very very hard the grains are very hard and this time uh, even though you push brakes or you you drive on it you're actually not making much changes to the quality of or the surface so there is not there is a difference but it's not actually significant but still if you zoom in you can actually find that they are uh, separated from each other and you can actually find the uh, find them separated and on the right side when it is like minus 5 you also have the same uh, behavior that uh, they change as you drive and as you put uh, traction so from here what we saw that okay uh, uh, you have to understand what kind of tire you are uh, building on but you also have to understand what kind of surface you are uh, uh, driving and it depends on the temperature if you have a fresh snow or old snow or ice or very melted snow and then depends on temperature how you are actually driving and how you are actually uh, traction so this is where we did but if you could have done more measurements with more uh, temperature uh, variations probably we could have get even more uh, information but uh, from this we had we had a und we understand that okay the snow behaves quite differently when you apply brakes and when you drive on it and then uh, uh, what we did was uh, in well, for example okay you take this pressure points and then uh, if you show these kind of plots uh, general audience no one understand it that, that clearly unless you start to explain it so I thought, okay, if you can actually convert, the, because you have three wavelengths, you have three set of data points. If you convert them into a RGB matrix, so that you can actually make a color scale of it. If it is white, so you have a dry surface. If it is black, you have a water surface. So based on that, you can actually make a color scale of different types of surfaces. A, uh, so based on that, you can actually uh, uh, here the clear ice ice water and water they they look black but actually if you see them on the bottom uh, plot right side they are actually separated but it's not a big difference that's why they all look black but it's they are actually not completely together uh, similar and then on the left side here you have a diff the same plots you have a dry and then a snow and then aged snow that are quite quite different so this was my idea okay if you uh, instead of uh, giving them the data points, if you can uh, make a color scale, so people actually start to understand easily what kind of surface they are actually driving on. Okay, and uh, that uh, uh, what we have been doing, and to make uh, some conclusions of it, uh, as I said, we sp I spoke about spectroscopy and then uh, imaging, and then based on these two techniques. You can classify a snow of different uh, physical properties like density, grain size, and how the surface uh, looks like, and then also uh, liquid water. So those are the four. Uh, I've written f three here, but the, the fourth one is missing here. But then uh, the other interesting part is if you can make a color scale of this whole data points, it's probably much easier for people to understand, so that they don't start to uh, understand the data, but they start to understand the images or the uh, color scale. Okay, that's from me. <laughs> <laughs> that was a rapid presentation. Thank you. Uh, we, of course, have qu time for questions. If there are any questions in the audience, I would just reach up your hand and I will come with a microphone. I can start it, I can kick it off with. Um, if you would like to develop this research after your PhD exam, in what direction would you go then? Uh, I would probably uh, use this uh, technique with the three diodes and then camera and then try to make it easier that everyone understand it. Mm. Uh, because when you start to having uh, these kind of spectrums, for example, it's actually a bit complicated to understand mm. unless you have been working with, with it for a while. Because, I mean, I, I didn't mention mu much of this, but there are so many peaks and then uh, valleys. Mm. So it's it's like this, and each of these peaks has a meaning for it. Mm. This is how they actually look for the, as I said, sugar levels in uh, blood. Mm. When there is a peak at certain uh, wavelength, that means sugar. Or when there is a peak at certain other wavelength, that means something else. So these peaks has specific meaning. Mm. 
but if if one has been working with it for a while it's easy to understand mm. not easy but it's managed to manageable to understand that's why for me it's probably this is the most easy way because uh, the system that the diodes they're not that expensive the camera is expensive but uh, i think things always get uh, cheaper as the time goes on but this is probably easier to even when you look at this image when you show these images people understand okay this something is happening to this and then when you make this color color code it's also easier that uh, what's going on mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. i think this is probably wha how i should uh, pur pursue mm -hmm. i will pursue <laughs> anyone else well pondering over something yes Sorry, Angelica said that. <laughs> okay. um, the indoor is is uh, giving different kind of results than uh, than the other ones. Can you? Is there any explanation uh, on indoor conditions that can explain this? Yes. Uh, the indoor one, uh, Pirelli, they have uh, actually built an indoor uh, track to test all the tides. It's in uh, Elspin. Or Elspin, yes. So it's a, a, a huge track that has a like a heavy, heavy cooling system. So they prepare the tracks and then they start driving different uh, compositions of tires to see what composition of tire actually has better braking and then traction uh, with changing uh, different surfaces. Uh, but the problem is, uh, at least uh, uh, fr what I realized was. The indoor was it has doesn't have that much humidity. It's more dry surface, and then uh, uh, the way they prepare it, it's also a bit uh, slightly different from the way you see outside, because uh, what they do is they spray water and then they let it uh, freeze itself. Then what happens is you you drove on it, so you have uh, some uh, broken uh, snow crystals. Then you spray water, and what you're gonna making is you're making a frozen bridges of water between all these snow crystals. So when you drive the next time, you're just breaking everything. And then after that, it's probably the same way like the sec first time. So this is what we realized, well, okay, when you prepare the surface or the sample or the, the track, you have a better, uh, so you understand there is a difference. Then when you drive once, so there is a difference, but after that, there is not much difference in the surface. It's you just keep on driving on the same kind of surface. But outdoors, it's uh, uh, the natural snow. It has more. Uh, it's, it's ice crystals. It's not water that you're uh, that they're spraying. It's uh, snow. The natural snow has more uh, strength in it than the artificial. For example, if you, I mean, nowadays they are uh, uh, using artificial snow for the ski slopes. And what's happened is the artificial snow has not that much str uh, strength in the bones, so it's more uh, fluffier but the natural snow has more uh, strength in it. So that was the main difference between uh, uh, plant colon or uh, and both of them, plant colon and then Lil Shostrask. They both are uh, frozen lakes and then uh, they use it to prepare tracks. And then uh, indoor is more, uh, very, very indoor, yeah, cooling system. <laughs> Satisfied? But uh, th that is also reason why, because when we do it outside, uh, at least uh, I, I didn't have that many pictures here, but we start to seeing a different, uh, um, very different changes outside than uh, indoor. Because as I said now, the indoor after the first try, everything looks uh, much very very similar. But outside, it's every time you get much very very different uh, results. So that's also one of the other uh, variation. More questions or thoughts, reflections? Uh, 
I would uh, like to thank you for a very interesting talk. And uh, secondly, do you have any um, ideas about quality? What do you think about snow quality in general? What is high quality? What is? High quality of snow for you. High quality? Yes. What do you mean high quality? High, high quality. What, I mean, you, you scale quality of snow. You, you say the performance of snow. Yeah. But it, and what would you c call something that is high quality performance? Uh, high quality performance yeah. snow. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, in this, uh, we we didn't come to that much conclusion th from there. Because you could you could count on on physical properties like friction. You could, c when you look at the ski slope and you look at the performance in in, in track for driving, etc. Uh, that is related. So I would say to high quality performance or high quality of snow. What you would expect when you go out skiing one day, where this is a good snow for me. Well, how how should I count? Uh, count on yeah. temperature is easy because you know that uh, uh, cold temperatures yes. really are really it's a, it's a very uh, high friction in snow and then you go into intermediates and then you change so I mean all those interesting slides and, and uh, optical uh, measurements you've done if you reflect on that and say for the for the end user I mean the public in general how, how could you give an ad advice yes uh, for example uh, when I'm doing uh, this type testing uh, one day it was like minus 24, 23 something. So we have, I've been doing uh, several tests, but the problem is the snow is not changing anymore. How many times they drive, how many times they break, the snow is the same quality. But if you have the same quality on a ski slope, you can't slide because it's uh, it induces more friction to the skis. But probably I think for the skis, I think it, d it depends on uh, what application you're looking into. Maybe for the ski slope, I don't know if I could say, but slightly around minus five is probably better temperature to slide because you get more uh, uh, not denser but at least uh, good quality snow as the you increase the and then it is also because when we are doing uh, these tests with the liquid water uh, one of my colleague uh, she used the same system and then uh, she uh, slope uh, ski around in the home market and what we see what we saw was there uh, before she did the measurements, before the day, it was like positive. And then when, when she did the measurements, it was negative. So what happened is this ski slope, the whole uh, snow structure become more like a, like big ice lumps. And then it's not a good uh, surface anymore for the, so I think it, uh, the quality depends on uh, a lot of factors. At least I think a couple of days of uh, temperature and then uh, s ski or uh, if if there is snow in a couple of days, it's a lot of things. How would happen in a couple of days? I think. Aging yes, also aging. Yeah. Uh, so this this is what we realize. Okay, if you, uh, it's a bit difficult to just say from one day measurements. You also have to have knowledge on what happened before and what's going to happen next next time, so that you can make more uh, uh, qualitative uh, conclusions of it. Thank you. Are there any more thoughts in the audience? On a personal note, Lavan, a guy from Hyderabad in, um, in <laughs> India <coughs> uh, <coughs> who is interested in snow in the most northern part of Sweden. How come? Tell us. Okay, this is, uh, this is the, like a very common question that I end up with always. But uh, what I can say is, as I said, when I'm uh, in KTH, I've been working uh, a lot with uh, these wind turbines. But uh, at that time, I was working with more like a case study. If you have money, if you want to put a wind turbine form somewhere, I look at the wind speed and then the wind direction, and then I could uh, give you a set of uh, details. Okay, if you w if you have this much money, you can have like 20 turbines and they should face this way. Mm. So this kind of work I was uh, involved in my masters. Mm. My thesis and my internships, they're all on this, uh, on this kind of uh, work. Mm. And then I saw this PhD that is uh, to detect icing on a wind turbine plates or frost. So I was interested, okay. so I came here, but then uh, we started working on this. Uh, slowly, it came to roads and then skis, a lot of applications added in. And then now, now it's more snow now yeah. than uh, ice. Yeah. So yeah. it's a bit of a yeah, fun story, I would say. Yeah, I would say too. <laughs>
Now, I would like to thank you, start with thanking you for, for this lecture today, and then I would like to tell you a little about what's coming up in the in Wetenskapens Hus the coming week. Uh, one of the aims of the university is to, to um, broaden the perspective of public understanding of science, and that is why we do these lectures in uh, pu this public lecture, open public lectures in this house. And I would like to thank you for contributing, for taking the time and making the effort, although you're in the final preparations for your PhD exam, when uh, times somehow seems to getting tighter and tighter and tighter. <laughs> so uh, thank you for making the effort, thank you for taking the time, and thank you for being a part of the house of thank you for science. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>